Hi again, it's Elena here for a bit more Tchaikovsky. So today I thought we would work on pages three and four, um, at least of my part, that is 16 bars before F until N. And this of course covers the fugue. Ah! So I'm aware that last week's Tchaikovsky tutorial went so ridiculously long. So I will try and organize my thoughts a little better, talk less, and really just take you through these two pages of music, sort out the challenges, and we will be on our way. So actually the, the first couple measures of this section that we're focusing on are to me some of the most problematic in the whole movement, um, not least because they, they follow a page turn. And I always get really stressed when I have to, you know, flip the page and so um, bearing that in mind, we'll just do what we can to set the hand and then maybe it's worth practicing um, turning the page really quickly and being set up in time. But let's start calmly, uh, 16 before F, um, with this passage. I find this so tricky for intonation. I can never quite get it in my ear, um, and I just, I find it so stressful. So something to me that's really helpful to do um, is to mark in my music what are the half steps and what are the whole steps? I've got um, I've got a system. A uh, a half step is sort of like a upside down or no a right side up up bow, and um, a whole step is an upside down down bow. So I would go uh, go through and um, either use those symbols or you can invent your own. Mark between each note if if it troubles you what is a half step and what is a whole step. And to me, it's a great cheat sheet for a phrase like this. So I, I would even go through in my mind thinking half, whole, half, half, whole, half, whole, half, augmented second, yeah, half, etc. So I really start to see visually like a little, I can crack the code of what this passage means for my fingers. Of course, then you want to layer that on top of having um, an understanding in your ear and your brain of what the passage should be. Um, and hopefully everything syncs up together. Again, this, um, you can use whatever fingering you like. Um, but because it's pianissimo, I, I hate to start it on the, the, the brassy E string. Now we get back to our melody and let's make this really crisp, really energetic, um, giving as much energy as we can in a soft dynamic. Again, up bows on the, these, that figure. I want to make this as energetic as possible, but I also really want to make it sound as beautiful as possible um, in each of these three sort of terraced phrases, terraced dynamics, and that means adjusting the weight of my bow for each um, four bar section. First we have the piano one, really um, soft but lively, so less pressure. <laughs> but maybe even more articulate in the left hand to make up for the fact that we're not using as much sound weight. Maybe I don't like that four there. Now a little more weight plus this chord. And then finally, this can be a bit louder, a bit brassier even. It's going to be louder anyway because it's on the E string. But finding ways that you can really um, exaggerate the dynamics and the differences between each of these four, four bar phrases because we really want it to escalate in intensity. So 
So it's like three different characters offering the same material. Um, I love these little interjections coming up. So let's really make the difference between the B flat and the B natural. And it says fortissimo, um, but still let's shape it. Let's really make, um, make a little phrase out of these measures. And then we get to a real arrival point. We're just playing our hearts out here. Um, these, the, the previous 16th notes slash semiquavers, um, I would really break down, um, practice really gluey, compact, all the stuff I was talking about last week. And then we get here. Um, this I would also, because there's so much activity going on, I would organize this for myself in that compact, gluey way. Uh, these bowings, I think it's probably too tricky to coordinate doing an up bow on the dotted eighth note slash quaver. <laughs> um, so obviously you can you can have your own bowing preferences, but um, I I do come out down bow on those. Even more energy on the accents. Then here comes an interesting um, bowing conundrum. What we worked out at previous sections um, is to do the up bow on the dotted note and a really um, hearty, earthy up bow on the low accented notes. So like this. Um, is a good time to touch on a point I made in another tutorial video, which is when we get really excited about musical material, often we do kind of extra things with our body, extra movements, gestures to show um, just how excited we are. We oftentimes don't even mean to. It's just like a physical expression of our excitement comes out. But we want to make sure that those movements aren't actually detracting from the sound. We want to instead focus our energy into the sounding point and just notice whether the um, the extra motions we're making are actually getting in the way of or detracting from what's coming out of our instruments. So this is a great section. I noticed myself doing it um, when I was playing through a few moments ago. So try when you're practicing, really be still, not rigid or frozen, but just calm in the body and see if you can focus all of your excitement, all of your energy, all of your intention right here. So rather than a, or whatever I did before, like a, a crazy, look at me, I'm doing an accent, really put it into the string. Now, especially here, prepare and do it with the sound. Oops. So I think the tendency for a lot of us, myself included, is to make some sort of dip with our with my body on that low D. But by doing that, I'm actually dragging my violin further away from my bow. When we want to do the opposite, we want to meet the bow with the violin. About it if you go you're you're it's like you're moving the bullseye away from the bow and arrow keep the bullseye where it is let the bow and arrow go to it something to, something to think about really in all music um, whether your gestures are out of habit, whether you don't even realize that you're doing them at all, if they're involuntary, um, and whether they're serving the music. Because for as important as a visual element to performing is, 
the most important thing is whether your intentions are being communicated clearly through your sound. Um, let's go on. So this is letter G. We're back to our kind of um, more quiet, more quietly energetic version of this theme. And back to material from the beginning. So again, you can practice those blocks, really making sure you're ready for each type of sound um, within a little section. Uh, I wanted to point out one thing because it came up in a live sectional about um, using the bow, how to approach the bow with the fingers and approach the string with the bow. For me personally, I think everyone will have all sorts of different opinions and techniques of, um, in order to address this. I like to move everything as little as possible. Keep my movements simple. No extra m movements, no extra energy. I'm super lazy. I want to do as little as I possibly can. I'm serious. So for something like these bouncy notes, I'm not thinking about making, you know, big floppy gestures with my fingers. I, I, I see a lot of people um, approach dotted notes with like a lot of stuff. I'm totally exaggerating. No one actually does that. Um, but I like to view the bow as, you know, I settle my, my hand into a comfortable position, establish contact with the bow, and just pull without really moving anything too much. I don't know if you can see my hand there. Kind of just as though I were doing it on the string. just a little bit more space between each note. So the hand is loose, relaxed. It's powerful in that it's gripping the string, but then it's just released. There isn't too much muss or fuss in between each stroke. Um, right. Etc. Let's go to the fugue, the moment we've all been waiting for. To be honest, it's actually not that much different um, in terms of the way I would approach it than any other of the material. We have the same sorts of strokes, same sorts of ideas musically. Um, now we just have to be listening out for all of the other stuff going around us. I mean, we were doing that already, but um, we really want to um, coordinate ourselves with all of the other sections in the fugue where, um, let's be honest, it is quite easy to kind of fly apart and um, veer off course a little bit. So I would say in the fugue, it's really important to think of being steady, but even on the back side of the beat. Um, so never letting our excitement uh, about the material get the better of us and cause us to tumble forward. So let's just practice this with a really cool head going through, um, figuring out where we should be for our string crossings, where the left hand should be, how can we make this as calm as possible so that when we're in the heat of the moment in performance, we don't tumble forward? So we play the first two bars with the first violins and then we kind of diverge. So let's reflect that in our sound. We want to blend and then we want to, we want to make our departure from the first known. are exciting. Let's have them pop out a little more, really articulate with the bow. Because we're trading off the moving notes with the first. And I find it easy, um, or not, not easy, I find it helpful to um, make myself little notes on which bow um, I'm going to be on in, in a figure where it's, for example, two notes under a slur and then two separate notes, just so that I'm, I'm sure which bow I'm on, um, it really helps to have a visual reminder uh, where I am, let's say, at the start of each measure. Um, not so that you make an accent on it or really draw any attention to it, it's just something that helps me organize my two hands together. So whatever bowing you're using, I find it helpful sometimes to mark it in. Um, 
so that uh, I just know which direction everything is going. So now we really want to be in the background, but a motor nonetheless. After we do our... Now we're syncopated, the violas are playing, stuff is getting really exciting. Let's keep it calm, really um, almost exaggerate the, the integrity of the rhythm. small bow for this stuff. Compact, gluey, concentrated. And in all the rests, don't stray too far from the string. Really keep it close even in the silences. So one more time. And uh, string crossings, that's that's a big issue here. So have your arm prepared for each of the string crossings so it's not ever a surprise like, oh my gosh, I have to go two strings over. Everything is nearby, everything is handy. Stairs. <laughs> uh, I, had a, I had big plans to say something in rhythm. Let me try again. Stay close. Stay close. Stay close. That's a tricky string crossing at I. So how, we want to make sure our elbow is ready, that everything is in as small miniature movements as possible. So rather than going the elbow having to travel, it's kind of in between. So we, we really just make the movements uh, with our fingertips. Stay close, stay close. That's one spot where I would probably mark my half steps and whole steps because otherwise I get it wrong like a zillion times. Stay close. And now we have, not that the stuff before wasn't of interest, but now we have a primary voice. So all of the stuff between, uh, well, for the last like eight bars or so, it's super important because it, it fills in all of the textures um, between the primary themes, um, but it should be more or less in the background. So take all of the energy that I'm sure you'll have when you get to this section and like bottle it up and make it really intense, but in a controlled way that's kind of like over here. So you're supporting the primary voices. Um, so now we're after I, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Now we can really step out into the forefront. And with these, um, with these figures, uh, where the last note is dotted under a slur, to me that means it, it just needs even more energy. Not quite an accent, but like a little uh, jolt, a little zing. So you take the bow off the string not too far again, because we don't want to fly off the rails, um, but just a little something like that. Maybe a little vibrato if you're not playing an open string. Working out the string crossings, keeping everything close. And making sure these accents are nice and crisp, that we, we feel that resistance, resistance before we play. Notice if you're accenting with your body, which I, I just noticed that I did. Now we have some moving notes, so I would definitely slow these down, practice these nice and gluily. Gluily? Is that a word? Oops. And through all
all of this material. I can't believe I haven't said it yet. We want to be making as many shapes as we can so that nothing is ever level or like a typewriter or robotic. We want it to be full of little peaks and valleys. So actually, I'm going to go back, let's say, to I and shape. I'm going to exaggerate as much as I possibly can because no one has ever gone to a concert and said, huh, I really thought that was too phrased. It was too musical, too interesting. So from I. Continue like this. So even in a phrase that's all fortissimo, it still needs to have nuance. I don't know how much the mic is picking up, but I'm really trying so hard to just phrase, follow the line, um, and make it as interesting as I possibly can. While still singing in rhythm. Section. So this is something I definitely need to spend time really coordinating. Again, sticky, gluey, close, small, um, and then freeing up uh, the more familiar I get with the material. I definitely might add figurings and bowings here just so that I know where I'm supposed to be on every note. as much information as I need to feel comfortable. Maybe I want to do a different fingering. That helped, changing from a four to an open D string. I'm gonna do that again. And then eventually speeding it up, freeing up the right hand. So breaking it down, not getting too stressed when something feels um, difficult or out of control, just rein it in, bring it right here, and dissect it calmly. What are the little tiny micro challenges, and how can you puzzle through them in a way that's both effective but also kind of fun? Moving on. I could phrase that much more. So all of these entrances, we are coming in with or after the first, so we really want to assert ourselves. Um, someone once told me that the second violin, to be noticed, has to play like twice as interestingly as the first violins. So whenever we have something that's exciting or that we want noticed, it has to really, really, really sparkle. So don't be afraid to really give it all you've got. Oops. That's a fun string crossing. I think I hate playing in second position, but sometimes it's necessary. One of this is one of those places. So we don't have to cross two strings. That was much better now that I didn't try and lead with my violin, keep the violin still, let the bow do the work. Keeping the dots active. Now we 
interject with the firsts. And even though it's slurred, keeping the left hand nice and active, again, so that we'll sparkle alongside the first, first violins. And now really tiny, compact, shiny, sparkly, I wanted to do I'm not sure I think I like down up get better contact could even do this at the tip why not let's try it mm, I don't know if I like that I feel like I have more control here where the where the bouncing point is a little more your, your opinion might be different. All right, so thank you for humoring me going on a trip through my own brain while practicing something like this, which is so intricate, has so many moving parts, um, bowings, funny positions, a zillion string crossings, um, dip, ch having to change the bow strokes like that, um, going from uh, melody to secondary voice, so many things to think about. So try and break it down as simply and as calmly as you can. Um, even if you don't do any of the things I specifically said, find ways to practice that excite you, that make the material manageable, and um, any work that you do on this fugue will definitely uh, translate to the rest of the movement. So happy fuguing, happy fourth movementing, and see you next time. <laughs>